Hi, nice Amanda. To meet you. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. God, how old are you now? <laughs> I know. So we were trying to think of that. I'm like, I was at high school or middle school that I had her as a teacher. And I was like, I think it was middle school. So I'm 24 yeah. now, graduated wow. college, working at the workforce board. <laughs> so, Good for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Congratulations. So yeah, you had me in middle school. What year did you graduate from? 2015, 2015. 2015. So you were... I started at Plymouth South Middle School in 2006. You were either my first or second eighth grade class. I want to say, yeah, because I remember like walking down to the cafeteria and your room was like down at the end. And I think it was tech ed, either one or two. You had the So honor. you, I think you guys had, right. And you were, I think you were part of the eighth grade class that I wasn't married at the time. I was Miss Haggerty. Okay, okay, yeah. I got married in the spring, and I hate to say it, but they used to yell down the hall, Miss Haggerty. God, that makes more sense. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, yes, all right. Yes, they would like yell it in the hall. And at the time, the principal was Mrs. Stemplensky. Oh, wow. That does, that and does right. Yeah, yeah. Does okay. that make sense? Wow. Yep. That all, now it all adds up. Yes. That's exactly what it was. Wow. Yeah. It was like my first or second year at Plymouth South Middle School. Wow. Okay. Okay. So now when did you leave Plymouth South Middle and move to, and go to Mashpee High? So I, I taught at Plymouth South Middle School for 10 years and I left in, let me see, my twins were born in 2014 and I left in 2015 your graduating year oh okay all right wow nice nice so do yep, you, are I you left from the Cape is that why you you came down here or so I was always I was um I always lived on the Cape even when I taught at Plymouth oh, okay. South Middle School I lived on the Cape. I was originally from north of Boston, up in Woburn. I grew up, but I um, had always summered on the Cape. So even when I taught at Plymouth, I was living on the Cape. Gotcha. And I don't know if you remember, it was your graduating year. Mr. Mike Lee passed away suddenly yes. in that January. He yes. had died of a brain aneurysm. And I had come back. He had been planning to retire. And I had come back of, from a long um, maternity leave. It would have been about an eight month maternity leave because I had had my twins. Mm -hmm. And um, after losing him in January, things were just not the same for me there. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Seaver had retired as the principal. Right. There was a new principal, then losing Mr. Mike Lee. I just, we were so tied together so closely in teaching in our classes, especially as the years yeah. went on. I couldn't, I just mentally couldn't continue to go mm -hmm. to school and not see him in that role. Right. And it had been one thing I was having a hard time wrapping my head around him retiring. Right. But then when that happened, there had been talk about not continuing tech and engineering at Plymouth South Middle School and changing a lot of things. And I just realized it was kind of time to leave. So I started looking and mm -hmm. Ashby, um, I never had taught high school. So I applied for the job thinking there's no way I would ever get it. And um, Mr. Looney, um, the director of career and technical education called me and he's like, so I've been looking at your resume and I know you don't fit the certification requirements, but we're pretty intrigued by what you said and what you have available and what you do. Would you be interested in looking at our job? And, you know, we talked more about it and they actually had to go for like a waiver to get me the position oh. um, through the Department of Ed. And I did it and I was thrilled when I took the job, but it was a little overwhelming. High school was definitely different than middle school and I wasn't sure how that would all look here or play out, but um, it's probably one of the best moves I've ever made. Um, awesome. There's a lot of opportunity here in Mashby. I'm, I miss a lot of colleagues in Plymouth. I loved some of my colleagues at Plymouth South Middle School, but the opportunity to explore STEM, to really branch out, become a robotics coach, none of those things were going to happen in Plymouth at the middle school True. Right. level the way they've been able to happen here in Mashby.
Right, right. I know. I've been at the workforce board for six months now. And since the day I've started, I've heard all about you and the amazing work that you've done. And right when I heard your last name, I'm like, I def I know her. I know her. And then we they showed me a picture and we looked you up at the Matching Middle High School and I was like, Yes, I had her as a teacher. So it's just small world and funny how things work that way. But um but yeah, I just want to thank you for joining me today and completing this interview with me. So, um, you know, here at the Workforce Board, we really wanted to highlight the third year of STEM week. And we also want to highlight the strong connectivity um, that the region has to innovation and technology. So I feel like just to get started, can you just tell me a bit about your role with STEM at Mashley Middle High School and like the classes that you teach and just kind of like your day to day schedule there? So um, I'm going into my sixth year here in Mashpee, which is just unbelievable for me to think about. Um, and I do, I teach eight through 12. So I'm fortunate in that I get to see middle school students and high school students. Yeah. I teach a semester long intro to engineering class where it's kind of like we call it priming the pump. We get our eighth graders in, they get to see what a makerspace is about, what STEM is and engineering. And then hopefully they have a passion to continue taking those classes in high school. And in high school, I teach technology and engineering, which is a year long course. And then I teach robotics one and two and intro to computer science. And those classes are more um, they're elective based, but, but some of them give them science credit. And those classes are really for kids who want to delve really deep into the area of STEM. You know? And I'm fortunate in that even though I teach at the high school, I've had the opportunity to do some cross-stage student teaching, which I'm super passionate about. And it's opportunities where my high school kids mentor, learn about activities, learn about different curriculum, and they mentor kids at the younger grade levels. Um, mm -hmm. Given this year with COVID-19, there's not a lot of moving back and forth between the schools, but in year past, I would put like eight kids in the van, we would drive over to KCC or QuestionNet, and my students would teach about underwater robotics or regular robotics, land-based robots, or maybe they would do programming, or we would build a miniature golf course, and then the kids would come together and decorate it and paint it together and code robots on it. Um, We've also done a project last year in the middle of COVID-19, well, right when it broke out, we were in the middle of creating a water table playground um, apparatus that my high school students in tech and engineering designed and we're gonna build for our elementary school students for their outside recess area. Wow. And the project's been since been put on hold, but any opportunity that we get for the big kids to work with the little kids is something that we do a lot here in Mashpee. It's kind of been my baby. It's what I've kind of developed once I've come here. And um, I'm really excited to see that the culture has spread. The administration supports that. And that's just one way that I think STEM has really spread in our district because other teachers are seeing how we can work together and collaborate. And we have more bigger widespread projects um, happening. We had a whole fifth grade build underwater sea perch ROVs that were mentored by our high school students. We then tested them at Willowbank Country Club. So it's really cool to see how the projects are growing here. Oh, that's great. I like that not only do you get to collaborate with like your colleagues, but then the students can collaborate with each other and other students outside of their own high school or middle school. So I love that. Um, so I know I had taken tech ed about 13 years ago with you. Is there any like advancements in STEM that have stood out to you that you think have changed or, you know, grown since that time or? Absolutely. I mean, teaching wasn't my first passion. It wasn't the job that I started out with after college. So when you had me for tech and um, ed at Plymouth South Middle School, it was really different back then. Yeah. I didn't come with a wealth of experience in education or in technology and engineering. I learned on the job. And back then it was a lot of hand and hand tools, coping saws to make CO2 cars. And we did, you know, small little projects. We did bird houses. I remember that was one of the first projects I ever did with you because I was really in an old wood shop, which yes. I taught in. Um, and eventually it changed over with like 3D printers I brought in and computers and we had some robots. But if you were to visit my classroom now, the advancements in STEM, like makerspace wasn't 
a big word when I first started teaching in 2006. No one really talked about a makerspace. Now everybody knows what a makerspace is and I teach in a makerspace. Um, I have plenty of robots. We do, I think girls are more, um, more vibrant in a makerspace because it seems more creative than like a tool or a wood shop. And so they're more comfortable and they really push themselves in the makerspace. I think that's a big change that I've seen mm -hmm. is the um, creativity of a makerspace and the ability for so many kids of so many different backgrounds and cultures to come and enjoy building and making and designing. And it's more accessible than mm -hmm. it was when I first started teaching. I think that even though I was a woman teaching tech ed, I think most of the kids came into middle school thinking like, this is a shop, it's tools, it's for yeah. the boys. And it, I don't even think my teaching practice reached the girls in the ways that it does now. Yeah, yes. So it's clear that you're passionate about STEM and you're so empowering to not only your colleagues, but your students as well. So how, in addition to your colleagues at Mashpee, how do you say you promote STEM to others? I love to collaborate, um, whether it be through attending conferences um, and presenting at conferences or learning from others at conferences or connecting with other educators. Um, I think it's really great. Here in Mashpee, I have been fortunate to be sent to many international conferences related to STEM and CTE and makerspaces and engineering. And I love the opportunity to just walk through the um, the halls where there's usually demonstrations. It's almost like a science fair for teachers and they have posters and they're presenting and I get to just walk through with my business cards and if I see a project that I'm really interested in, I go up and I talk to the educator and I'm never afraid to say, hey, I'm Amanda Howe from Mashpee. Would you like to collaborate with me moving mm -hmm. forward? And I hand out my business card and there's been times where it's worked out great and we've done these amazing collaborations. And then there's been times where people haven't connected in the way that you want them to, but you still take away the ideas of like, I loved that project they were doing. And even though we're not gonna work together, I'm gonna take their project and apply it here. Mm -hmm. um, for example, a big collaboration we had last year was the Upper Cape Cod Hackathon, where we went to the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribal Center. We had schools from like Falmouth and Sandwich and Mashpee, Upper Cape Cod Tech. We all worked together for the kids to participate in the first ever hackathon on Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great day. It was awesome to see kids outside of the district collaborating on something educationally because they collaborate athletics all the time you know they get on the athletic field and they compete but very rarely do we ever throw high school kids together to work together or compete or collaborate in the educational or academic setting and um it was completely successful it's definitely something we'll continue moving forward but again <laughs> due to the pandemic we had to kind of put it on hold this year that's awesome i hadn't heard about that before so i like that and you also have I've heard about some professional development work you've done too with other colleagues as well, or? So I have, I've, I've taught some classes through on um, the Cape Cod STEM network on like how to make your classroom into a makerspace. Um, I think that a lot of people feel like you need to have specifically have a makerspace to have that ability to be creative in your classroom. And I think it's more about having a mentality of how you apply and how you teach and facilitate and, and push the kids to be student driven. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times I like, I've done professional development with the Cape Cod STEM network specifically on makerspaces, but I've also presented at many conferences on different things like e-portfolio, for students. So how do you assess project-based learning for students? And I do it through an e-portfolio where they are able to show the process of what they've done um, for professional development. Oh, okay. I've um, also, though, I'm also the vice president of Mass Tech. So that's the Massachusetts Technology Engineering um, Consortium. So they are all the technology and engineering teachers in Massachusetts. And I was recently nominated and voted as their vice president. So I do professional development through that as well. Oh, okay. And you were also STEM teacher of the year, which congratulations. That's such a huge honor and an incredible tribute for you and as a female teacher too. So I do feel that this award, you winning this award and this honor 
can help raise awareness that women can enter careers like within STEM education? Absolutely. Absolutely. I definitely think um, it definitely boosted me. It propelled me into another kind of like realm in education, um, an opportunity to collaborate with other people. Um, I think that STEM Teacher of the Year was also a really great accomplishment and recognition because it was in the field of engineering and robotics where we don't necessarily see a lot of females teaching those classes. Um, it's one thing to receive STEM Teacher of the Year as a science teacher or a math teacher, and that is a great honor as well. It's fabulous, but it's just more of the norm, right? That those teachers are female. You don't see as many STEM teachers in engineering that are a female in promoting using tools and machines and advanced manufacturing, different um, machinery. So I definitely think that it also motivated my students here that like, oh, this is Mrs. Howe, like who we see every day. And she got recognized for that. And I think that it's made me be able to connect with other female teachers in the field of intro to computer science or engineering that are maybe over they're looked over i think they're still looked over because mm -hmm. it's just so abnormal to see us succeeding at that level right 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 yeah that's an amazing recognition and how do you how would you say that you promote stem education for girls in the underrepresented populations in mashpee so um, we've had different activities here. We've had some STEMinist activities where we have actually tried to create a small club for, for girls to feel comfortable doing STEM activities. But I've actually found that isolating girls in STEM hasn't really promoted them to be more active in STEM. What I find is that when they're in my class, it, it's always amazing to me that they'll join my class and they might be kind of quiet or meek or I may not, you know, really recognize how interested they are in STEM. But one activity or one project will stem an interest in a student. And if I can see that an underrepresented population student or a female student is interested in something, then I really push that one activity with that student. For example, I've had many special needs students in my class who joined my robotics class and they may not be able to participate or achieve at the same level in their academic courses, but they come into robotics and they're actually competing and achieving better than their typical peers because they have a propensity for understanding programming or they've always loved building Legos and now somebody puts them in a robots class and says, here's nuts and bolts and metal, put it together. And it, right. it's right up their alley. They yeah. can work individually or collaboratively at their own pace. It's self-driven and these kids just fly. So when I see students really grab onto something, then I let them go and run with it. Um, female students have really gravitated to doing sea perch ROVs. They love underwater ROVs. They love the opportunity to mentor younger kids. I think it's just that nature versus nurture for yep. females. And so if you can connect a STEM project with an opportunity to share their knowledge, girls naturally kind of go in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, I had a student today, advanced manufacturing, tech and engineering. You know, she was able to really get into computer aided drafting software today and mm -hmm. run with making a sign and being really creative. And I noticed in her that I was like, she has this propensity that I don't even think she knew she had. Mm, and my goal will be moving forward to really feed that and push her to go in that direction. Right, right. I know myself as a visual learner, like anything hands-on is really where I participate the most in and stay engaged for quite a period of time. And I've been seeing some pictures of your classroom and how you kind of structure your classroom to incorporate that hands-on learning. So can you kind of talk a little bit about that as well? So I have a really non-traditional classroom setting. Um, I don't typically teach in front of the class for a long period of time where I lecture. That just isn't my style. I don't think it ever has been. Um, I really will introduce um, the lessons for the day and the lessons may not even be the same depending on what the kids 
they're working on. And then the kids get the opportunity to independently work on their projects. So for example, in my robotics class, there at any given time, there's probably three or four different platforms of robots being built or programmed, depending on what the kid's ability is and what their desire is to learn. So um, if students come in with not a lot of knowledge of building, they may start at a entry level robot, but if kids are on my competitive robotics team, then they actually get the opportunity to continue to work on their robot that they use for competitions. Oh. And then there's some kids who join robotics and their real goal is to understand the programming. So they may have a Sphero robot and they may be writing in a text or block based program and learning programming. So that's just one way that robotics is really hands on in a tech and engineering or an intro to engineering class. You know, there could be kids who are one kid could be working on the laser engraver. Another kid could be creating something on the shop bot while two kids are working on the lathe. So I tend to just walk around and facilitate and answer questions on what the kids need and keep them moving forward. And we've developed a culture in the class where the kids understand that like Mrs. Howe put the project forward, there's a due date, I take pictures, I write reflections, I post them on my website and she checks in and I just keep moving forward in my projects. And it really creates a lot of 21st century skills for the kids, independence, they become self-driven, they become leaders, um, they they really gravitate to that ability to um, do, like you said, hands-on, their visual learners, also to do something they enjoy. Yeah, right. And you've also touched upon the increase in female participation in robotics as well. So, and you kind of talked about what you think caused this increase. Do you, now how do they be, is it a class classes of robotics or you also have a robotics club like I'm just thinking of how do you do you actively recruit the students or is it just like a word of mouth among the school and the halls with their peers so we um, have a robotics team here that is about five years old so it's fairly young but we were really fortunate that when we started it it came from the kids who were taking the class the robotics class and the tech and engineering class they kind of you know mashby always wanted a robotics team we didn't have one developed before i came and so i seeked out individuals in my classes that i thought could start the team and we were lucky in that we got four boys that were interested in starting the team and they started it and then word of mouth and Pop, um, popularity and they did fairly well and I promoted it and then we all of a sudden had a girls team and the girls oh. started in seventh grade they came really interested in robots and they are now in 10th grade and they're going to be participating in their first competition on October 24th for this year they last year they've competed you know in the past years and gone as far as regionals um, we've had a lot of success with the robotics team I think word of mouth and the ability for the team to be so successful so quickly has grab has caused more people to join. Um, our boys teams last year would have gone to Worlds in Kentucky, which would have been a huge um, feat, a huge yeah. accomplishment. Uh, we were actually ready to go, and then COVID hit, and wow. the tournament was canceled. Wow. So you know, we're hoping for a good year this year, hoping that they can make it. Um, but I think that the success over a short period of time by the students who have been just remarkable in their ability to create these robots and compete has caused more kids to join over time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And separate Hi. from the female robotics team, the Steminist Club is its own thing as well that you had created or? The Seminist, the Seminist Club is kind of just a group that oh, okay. does some individual activities. Okay. We had, it was a little bit more vibrant a couple years ago, but we haven't pushed it as much um, recently, just because we found that girls, isolating girls into one club called Seminist wasn't really bringing them all in together. I found that actually having them work on individual projects that they were interested in got more kids involved. Like we have the girls team that just joined the robotics team or right. the girls that run the CPRHROV 
Okay. Um, we have a lot of girls that like to go to hackathons and they like to code and program, but it was hard to bring them together as just one group. I don't think, to be honest, I don't think these younger girls want to be labeled as I'm a girl who just does STEM. I think they you just want to be like, I am who I am and I do STEM and I'm really good at it, but I don't need to put a label on it and I don't need to be in an individual group. That's just my gut feeling, yeah. but they yeah. like the idea of, I think, getting the recognition for who they are as a person for mm -hmm. what they've accomplished. Mm -hmm. I agree too. I know being a female myself, I have a younger sister and when you're at that age trying to explore so many different avenues and, you know, high school is really where you start to learn about all these different career pathways that you don't have to label as, oh, I am gonna follow my footsteps in STEM, but hey, this is an interest, this is an option of something that I can pursue in the future. So I, yeah, I agree, that's very true. Um, also, I'd love to talk about, because this was very interesting, I had some time to do some research on the different projects that you did. And can you talk about the project in Lao that you did with the 3D printing and you worked with another professor from Australia, I believe it was? Yeah, so that was one of the first projects that I did that was a global project that really was a big collaborative project. I had been um, sent to ISTE in um, Denver, Colorado by Mashpee, which is the International Society for Technology um, Educators. And so it's a big international conference where teachers go from all over the world and they get to collaborate and in, in, in hear from each other. And it really opened my eyes to what was out there. And so I happened to be standing in a coffee line and this person behind me was just like, hey, um, do you know where, I think she asked where something was in Denver, Colorado and we like started talking to our my colleague and I and and we were like oh you know we don't know that but we're from Ashby and you know she was like I'm from Australia which we could tell from her accent yeah. and she you know we were like we're going to be heading out to go see some stuff outside the city would you like to come so she joined us she jumped in the car with my colleague and my three other colleagues that were with us from Mashby and we went out and explored um the Rockies we got to see the Colorado Rockies for a while and talk with each other and as we were talking, we learned that she does these really great projects in Australia and she's got this whole group of women that do STEM projects and she, she ended up spending the whole conference with us and we developed a really great friendship and we ended up, she thought that the things my students were doing here in Mashpee in tech and engineering could be helpful to the people she was working with in Lao in the connection she had. And she was really convinced that my kids could make things with the 3D printers that could better the lives of individuals in Laos. Right. And I was like, we left the conference and I was like, this is never going to happen. Like, right. this is just a, such a broad scale. Like, who's yeah. ever going to make this Right. Happen? And I wasn't even on the plane. And I got an email from her that was like, all right, I've already outlined how the project could work. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like I just want to go home and see my husband and my four kids. Like I haven't thought about yeah. this. And it she was great. She had this great tenacity and this great personality. And she pushed. And um yeah. I came in in September and I posed the the project to my students. And I think they were just like, here's Mrs. Howe and another like crazy project she's gonna do. It's never gonna happen. And we're never going to send stuff to Lao. Next thing we know, like my students were Skyping with Rachel in Australia, Skyping with students in Lao. My students were building robots here, showing them to the, to the kids in Lao, like look at the robots we've built. My students were designing in, in CAD software and sending 3D printed um, items to Rachel. She got a printer donated to Lao. Next thing you know, we're 3D printing items that were designed here in Mashpee. And we found out that, you know, they didn't, they had these library books that would go up and down the Mekong River and kids were not being exposed to education. They didn't even get to go to school. They were like in these farming villages. So my students created a tic-tac-toe board game, you know, just simple tic-tac-toe, everything we take for granted here in the United States. And they went on to Google Translate and they translated the directions into Loatian and we sent it to the monks in Lao and we're like, is this appropriate? Did we get it right? They're like, yes, they're like, it's actually correct. Um, and we made over a dozen games that are now going up and down the Mekong River and being used by children to learn patterns. Also, they created a strainer for food. So we went through the whole process of like, could we 3D print items they could use for food? 
well, no, we couldn't because our PLA wasn't food safe. Oh. And they were cooking over a fi open fire. The plastic okay. would melt. But our kids created a strainer, and then they found out that in the village they had a wells that had no place to put their soap to keep it clean, to wash their hands. So they started hanging our strainers from the wells. And the kit, and they kept the soap in the strainers. Wow. Okay. So that they wouldn't get the soap wouldn't get all scummy and disintegrate mm -hmm. in the wells and get lost. Um, the project was amazing. It that was year one. Year two, it grew into let's cook a meal together. Let's make a movie, um, actually chronicling what we did in year one. We had an individual um, senior who was a musician compose original music and score for the movie. We had students create the movie um, about the project. Um, and then we presented the whole thing at ISTE two years later. Um, and Rachel came back from Australia. She came to Nashville actually and met our students and met our faculty. And then we all went out to ISTE in Chicago and presented together. Wow. That is amazing. I feel like that's like a once in a lifetime project for you and the students. Like I would never forget that if I was a student participating in that project. That's amazing. That's amazing. Wow. Thank so it, it continued over, it was a two year thing after the movie was completed and you guys presented it. And it It ended up being a two year project. So year one was like all the creation of the project of the products. Year two was like chronicling it with the movie, the food, the music. We had students who designed a logo. That was the logo that we used on the poster for the presentation. Um, it really, it just, it was two years. Every time I really look at that project, it was just like this tree. And every time someone spoke, a new branch grew off and then something else happened with it. Right, right. And it, it was just, it was really organic. Nothing was really planned. It was probably the pinnacle of one of my projects. I don't know if we'll ever, ever create something <laughs> like that again. Um, it was pretty fantastic. Um, I, it took a lot of work. I've tried to kind of, you know, redo it in some capacity. The hackathon was pretty um, impressive. That was a pretty good one. The sea perch ROVs with every fifth grader in our district making their own underwater sea perch ROVs pretty up there. Yeah. I, I don't know. Every time I think like, you know, making the new water table for a KCC, that that's pretty cool if we can yeah. get it done. You know, totally. I, I always think we've hit hit the pinnacle and then we try something different. Right. You never know what the future holds, especially nowadays. You take it day by day. <laughs> um, so you talked yeah, about how Rachel. Exactly. Yeah, it's all you can do. So you talked about how Rachel came from Australia to your classroom in Mashpee. So can you talk about also some more influential visitors that you had to your classroom and anybody else who has came to stop by to see the structure of your classroom and your teaching? So we were really fortunate last year. Um, Lieutenant Governor Polito came in and visited the school and came to my classroom. She was really interested in the robotics that was happening. Um, she had been planning to come down to go to the Cape Cod STEM Networks event for robots. And she decided to take a side trip here to Mashpee and come to my classroom. So that was pretty exciting. My family was pretty impressed that um, the Lieutenant and a governor was in my classroom right. um, that day. And it was it was cool to share, you know, what I've done. And then Secretary of Education Pizer was also has also come by. He came by on um, STEM Teacher of the Year Day last year when they gave me the award. So that was pretty cool too to have him speak about what I do in my classroom and and have his ear for an hour in the way that I teach. And it's so different. I don't look at the way that I teach as the norm. And so I always am self-conscious about whether I'm really teaching appropriately or to the best of my students, for the best of my students. I always am trying to teach for the best of my students, but I wonder if because I'm so non-traditional, are they getting what they need? Are they getting the curriculum the way that they need it? Um, I guess they are. So I'll, I'll keep going Definitely with it until are. someone tells me I'm not. <laughs> and then um, from like a Hollywood aspect um a couple years ago we had we connected with henry winkler uh the fawns and he joined um our class virtually through through um mm. skype because he wrote a book 
uh, about robots and about being dyslexic and our first grade students were reading it and the first grade teacher reached out to me and said Amanda can you have some of your students build robots and come down to my class and share because they're reading the story about robots and I was like mm -hmm. okay so then Henry Winkler had been doing a thing on Twitter or something to get you know some publicity for his book so I direct messaged him on Twitter and was like, hey, you know, would you be interested in Skyping with our students? We've got this whole big project going on. We're sharing robots. We're really interested in your book. And, and he like wrote back. It was shocking. And wow. he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll Skype with your students. So like he called on the phone and then he Skyped with the students. And it was cool because our high school students actually built a model of his robot from his book him and his co-author Lynn Oliver, she was involved wow. too. It was really cool. They both joined the Skype session. Wow. And um, our students animated, did an animation in um, Maya and using 3D mm -hmm. software, three-dimensional software. And um, some art students actually drew um, a, a model of what his robot would look like from what they read and they then presented it to him a poster to them our students we had everyone in the makerspace all the kids first graders high schoolers and they all got their chance to talk to him and uh, lynn oliver our special education students got to get up and speak to him and tell him like look at the robot that i built and wow. it was really cool That's i mean it was so just awesome wow he was so down to earth that's so cool i think it's nice too for the students like not only to get the recognition from you and their teachers that they see every day at Mashpee, but you know, to get that one-on-one -on -one Skype call with someone from Hollywood, like that's amazing. That's amazing. So, and I'm sure he'll come to be like a role model for one of the students too. And I know that you, even though you say that you're not sure if your learning style sticks with the students, but I know it definitely does. And that you probably are a role model for other female students as well. Who would you say that, you know, you follow in the STEM community and who would be your role model that you consider today? It's so funny, you, you know, you gave me the questions and I've been thinking about this role model thing. It's a tough um, one. <laughs> and it is a tough one. And so for a role model when it comes to the STEM community, I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for Rich Mike Lee, mm -hmm. who was the previous um, technology education teacher at Plymouth South Middle School. Right. I mean, he... He took someone who was completely green and he modeled me and made me the teacher I am today. His modeling of project-based learning and, you know, empowering students was definitely something that he did very well. And he also showed me how to use every hand and power tool that I know to use today. And without him, I wouldn't be sitting here. Um, he's definitely my biggest role model when it comes to education. When it comes to, I think you also have role models in your personal life. Yeah. And for me, um, my role models in my personal life, and they keep me so grounded, are definitely like my family. You know, my mom was a working mom and she came home late many nights um, from her job at USA Today and she still had time for me and always put a good meal on the table. And I think that what I saw in her, just her ability to balance work and life mm -hmm. was, is something that I hold really dear to me today. Mm -hmm. As a mom of four children and a, a career woman, I couldn't do one without the other. I wouldn't right. be a good stay at home mom and I wouldn't be a good teacher if I wasn't a mom. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, my mom seeing her as a working, a working woman was huge mm -hmm. in, in me being who I am today. Mm -hmm. Um, and my husband, he just keeps me, he keeps me grounded. He, he shows me like life is fun and he tells me to like relax and calm down and, and take a break. And, and that's just so important. I couldn't do it without him in my ear, supporting me a hundred percent along the way. I wouldn't have got STEM teacher of the year if it wasn't for him. Um, the way that I can rely on him when it comes to helping to take out with the, take the kid, take care of the kids and mm -hmm. to support me. Mm -hmm. And then my dad, he's just always there with that like voice of reason. When like I, I have a question that like something's not working right for me, or I, I question my own personal integrity. He seems to just kind of put it all in perspective. So I guess those are like my biggest role models. I love that. I like that you gave too, like a STEM role model in your personal life because I know that you were a mom of four 
four children? Do you have four kids? Yeah, I four do. Kids. And twins, one of two are twins. Wow. Yeah, I have yeah. I have an 11 year old, I have a nine year old, and I have a six year old twins, boys and girls. Wow. Boys wow. And girls. Yeah. Three boys and a girl. That's right. what we always say. <laughs> So you definitely have your hands full, but you know, you're doing an amazing job with all your innovation and your cutting edge technology. Like it's, it's amazing. You know, I could listen to your stories all day. So um, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me this afternoon. I hope that I can meet you and come and see you soon once COVID is over and maybe come tour your classroom because that would be amazing. And absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely. So we look forward to collaborating in the future. And thank you so much for taking part in our STEM event because this will be posted hopefully by Monday and for everyone to view and take part in. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And Samantha, it's been wonderful to spend the time with you and see you and see how what a great female role model yourself you've grown into. You know, I think the best, the biggest joy a teacher can get is to be able to connect with a student that they've had mm -hmm. years past and see how successful they've become mm -hmm. and what they've done. Because, you know, you get them, I feel like it's like, you get them for a year and then maybe they go off and you don't really get to see them again and you don't get to see what they become and you know you hope that you've left a lasting impression or that you've made their life better in some way not even that you make an impression but that you've made their life better and to see how successful you've become is awesome i'm so proud of you and thank, thank you. you thank you i'm so glad you know the world works in weird ways and like i said when i saw your name i'm like i know her that's definitely my teacher <laughs> That's really cool. I can't yeah. think of a better way to celebrate a STEM week. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much, Amanda. We'll talk soon. You're welcome. Hoping to see you soon in person. Yes, me too.